Ralph Keyes, author of We the Lonely People, writes, above all else, we Americans value mobility, convenience, and privacy. Of these, privacy is our most cherished value. Such importance do we place on this, most of us keep our distance from people, lest we interrupt or invade their privacy. Now, cherished privacy is a relatively modern thing. 200 years ago, people drew their identity mostly from family, tribe, clubs, and church. But with the introduction of first print media, then television, then computers, and then smartphones, people can be alone and, uh, you know, amuse themselves with their own, you know, technology. Uh, did you see, uh, any of you see the ESPN uh, footage of the uh, uh, six or eight girls at the uh, Colorado at Arizona game? Anybody see that? Raise your hand. I just want to know if, you know, it, they, okay, so about, about eight girls were, were, were at the baseball game and, uh, oh yeah, there it is. Why am I telling the story? So, so there they go. Is this on uh, video, Pat? There they are. I said eight, and that's what it is. Isn't it amazing? Uh, nobody's talking to each other. Very, very little. Everybody's looking at their phone and taking selfies. Uh, they have no idea what's going on in the baseball field. Not sure why they're at the game. So the commentator keeps, see, keeps coming back. This is the biggest show going at the game. And uh, well, anyway, enough of that. But 46% uh, um, of people say they've been fubbed recently. That's phone snubbed. In other words, you're out, to, you're out to lunch with your friend and she pulls out her iPhone and starts texting away and you just, you're sitting there like, why did we come to lunch, you know? And... Uh, so this is the fifth in a series of messages called Suburban Myths. We're looking at things that are assumed in our culture to be true, taught, everybody kind of agrees, but we're finding that they're myths. They're not true. A few weeks ago we looked at the, uh, the, the, the pleasure myth. Pleasure myth goes something like this, I can do whatever I want sexually, as long as I don't harm someone, it's okay. Or I can do whatever I want, expressing myself sexually. I'll settle down when I get married. And we tried to show that those things are not true. A couple weeks we looked at the one, more education makes you wiser. The more degrees you have, the more letters you have after your name, the wiser you become. Well, maybe. But if the more learning actually pushes you away from God and you feel like you have less need for Him then it doesn't make you wiser because uh, wisdom comes from God. Last week we looked at the uh, myth, work is a drag. Most people, our culture kind of say, yeah, it works, yeah, kind of a drag. You look forward to the weekend or the vacation. But Solomon, who's our teacher in this series, smartest man in the world, shows that work does not need to be a drag if you know who you work for. And we're supposed to work for Christ. He's supposed to be the ultimate person we're working for and transforms everything. Okay, what's the myth I want to look at with you today? Strong people don't need anybody. Isn't that what we're taught? Yeah, if you're really strong, especially for men. If you're really strong, man, you know, something, you hit a bump in the road, you're strong. You can take it. You don't need to cry. You don't need anybody. Uh, you can, you know, you, you can handle this yourself. Most men say they have no friends. Some women confess they have no friends. I mean, really close friends. Why do we have such a hard time cultivating close relationships? Let's look at what Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes. So there's a Bible in the seat back in front of you, or you brought your own, or you use your smartphone. Ecclesiastes is right in the middle of the Bible. I'm sure there are many reasons we have a difficult time cultivating close friendships, but Solomon identifies at least two. One is injustice. Chapter 4, again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. That's a happy thought. 
mean, he says things are so bad, those who have died are better off than us who are still living. Better yet, if you had never been born. Who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. He's saying, I've seen all these people who are oppressed. I've seen all these people that are doing the oppressing. And I've seen so much evil done. It's better not to have been born into all this. It sounds like he was writing this year. Like he was writing about ISIS and all the, uh, the Christian men who have been killed. The Christian women who have been raped. All the Christian churches that have been destroyed and their libraries and their artifacts. Or like he had been to Roseburg and saw what happened at Unqua Community College. It's so evil. It's so unbelievable. You'd be better not to have been born into all this. He's saying when you see so many terrible things happen, it makes you want to pull back. It makes you want to be suspicious of everyone. Trust no one. Be wary of people. Speak to no one. Lock and double lock your doors. Second thing he identifies is envy. Chapter 4, verse 4. And I saw all, that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. He looked at people in companies and, and working and he said you know most of the motivation for why these people are working so hard is envy they want what somebody else has or they want more than what somebody else has or they're in a company and they want to be paid more than the person next to them they think they're more valuable so he says this envy actually destroys teamwork in a company and people are stabbing each other in the back rather than being a team they're fighting with each other competing with each other Have you ever found yourself celebrating someone else's failures no I haven't either I've heard I've read that sometimes some people envy Jealousy pushes people away from us. Now even though Solomon sees these things that push us away from people, he knows it's a myth that strong people don't need anybody. He knows that God made us to need God. Remember last week, God has put eternity in every human being's heart. We have a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. We need God and we need people, Solomon knows. So why do we so desperately need relationships with people? Solomon identifies at least five reasons. One, they give us a reason to live. Chapter 4, verse 7. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. He had no one. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. Why am I depriving, depriving myself of so much enjoyment? This too is meaningless. A meaningless business. So he was all alone, yet he was working hard day after day, getting more and more wealth. He had plenty, but he was getting more. He says, why am I doing this? Jamie is our uh, senior at Lincoln High School. And uh, she's a very good athlete. Um, she's a cheerleader at the, uh, on the Lincoln High School cheerleading team. And so after they score a touchdown, this will be Jamie after, uh, after the score uh, going down the, down the field. So there she is. So uh, she's uh, many, we have, we have uh, some athletic boys in our family and I've seen several of them challenge her to a push-up contest and go down. I would never think of challenging Jamie. She's very athletic. Well, anyway, this summer, Tad, our oldest son, and Cam and Jamie were working out. And they were out counting on the street in front of us. I think they were doing like 200-meter sprints. And so they did their first sprint. And uh, you can probably take down the photo. Uh, that's good. Jamie said, oh, they left it up about 10 minutes, the first service. So, okay. Um, so they did their first sprint, and uh, Tad won, and Cam was right behind, and Jamie was back about 15 feet. 
Then they did their second sprint, and same thing. I think Cam won that time. Tad was close behind, and, and Jamie about 15 feet back. Then they did the third one, same results. Tad and Cam, uh, uh, Jamie's back a ways. Fourth sprint, same result. Then six high school boys came around the corner. And so they lined up to do the fifth sprint. They took off, and all of a sudden, Jamie comes flying by like a missile. And Tad says to her, I thought you had no more juice in you. Where did you get that? She obviously, now she had a reason to perform. <laughs> and the boys went around the corner and they did a six sprint. The same result, Jamie was off way, way behind again. People give us a reason to live. Two, they increase our work output. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Solomon is saying one plus one does not equal two. One plus one equals three or four. It's been proven many times. Two people working together can accomplish more than they could have done individually. They found this true with uh, draft horses as well. At a uh, uh, country fair, uh, the winning draft horse pulled a sled weighted with 4,500 pounds. Second place pulled 4,000 pounds. And somebody got the idea, why don't we harness these two fellows together and see what they can pull. Together, they pulled 12,000 pounds. Third, people can provide us with encouragement and support. Verse 10, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. We've all seen or heard the sad story of an elderly person living alone who falls down and can't reach her cell phone or can't reach his landline. And he lays there for hours, maybe even days. Solomon says, pity the person in that situation. Pity the person who has no mate or no friend or no close you know, sibling to, to be with. They're all alone and they get discouraged and, and depressed and they have no one to talk them out of it. A gal named Claria Nall, young mother in Oklahoma, was having a very bad day. The, the, uh, dish, uh, the washing machine broke and she had to call somebody to repair it. She was getting all these phone, phone calls on her cell phone. Everyone was a problem, different things she had to solve. And then the mail came, and she got a bill that they had no money to pay. And so she lifted her one-year-old up into her high chair, set her down, and then she just put her head down on top of the high chair and began to cry. And her daughter took her pacifier out of her mouth and put it in her mommy's. I mean, we just kind of naturally, including little babies, know that everybody needs to be loved and cared for. We kind of all know it's a myth that strong people don't need anybody. You share your joy with someone and you double it. Ever been to a game, a football game or basketball game or something and team scores and you're giving each other a high five? You guys aren't even in the game, but you're sharing your joy. You share your grief with somebody, you cut it in half. Verse 11, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Now, I don't want some of you young guys getting ideas on how you're going to apply this verse. <laughs> and it's not even true. A man and woman lie down together. It doesn't even guarantee that you will stay a a warm. I woke up one day and I said to Jory, how'd you sleep? She says, not so well. I was cold. You turned over and you pulled all the blankets with you and I couldn't get them back and I laid there cold. Solomon's point is that two people together can encourage and support each other. Fourth, people can help protect, they can help protect us. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. We tell our daughter Cam, who's a student at the University of Montana, don't walk across campus alone, especially never at night. There's strength in numbers. 
Two people have a better chance of protecting themselves. Animals seem to know this by, you know, just naturally, instinctively. You see a flock of birds, a swarm of bees, or a herd of elk. Joel took this uh, video of uh, elk in our property. We get 10 to uh, even as many as 100 elk come through our property once a week probably. This is just a, a small group of them. Alan, Alan McGinnis in his book, The Power of Optim Optimism, talks about the Vietnam War and what a, what a tough war that was for our country. It was particularly tough for the military. They're over there and it was so dangerous. Our son just got out of the military and he served two tours in Afghanistan. And he said, Dad, you know, the stuff we did over there was so scary. But in the Vietnam War, not only were, was it dangerous, but America, as a, as, a, you know, as a culture, we had rejected the war. And so they were over there fighting with no support from home, except for their families. They come home and there's no big welcome, there's no big thank you. It's kind of an awful experience for military people. Especially if you got shot down and taken as prisoner of war. Gerald Coffey uh, wrote a book out of those years about being a prisoner of war over there. He got shot down over the South China Sea and he was a prisoner for seven years. And the Vietnamese took him and they tortured him. Broke bones, just beat him up. And they finally got him to sign something. And then they threw him back in his cell and he's broken and he's bleeding. And worst of all, he feels bad that he gave something up. All of a sudden he hears a voice. Hey, person in cell six with the broken arm. Are you okay? It was Colonel Robinson Risner. Now he knew there was somebody else with him, and he says, yeah, I feel bad that they got something out of me. He said, hey, if they take you and torture you, they're going to get what they want. The key is to bounce back and don't give up. Lick your wounds and get up again. And communicate with each other here. The only way is through knocking on the, the, the cell walls. They call that place Heartbreak Hotel. And they would support each other. So he would, Coffee would get taken for torture or be tortured right in his cell there. And other guys would be knocking on the wall saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Hang in there. Don't give up. And then when something was happening in a cell next to him, he'd be doing the same. Together, they were able to make it through. Finally, people increase our faith. Verse 12, a cord of three, stands is, three strands is not quickly broken. So you take a cord of one strand, you can break this pretty easily. I'm not going to demonstrate because I might not be able to break it. <laughs> and, and my point wouldn't work so good. Two strands uh, is definitely tough to break. Three strands is not easily broken for anybody here in the room. Not even Bill or Sh Joey Schweinfurth. What, what's Solomon talking about? Well, he's talking about three people, threefold relationship, but I don't think he's talking about three people. I think he's talking about two people plus God. Two friends plus God or a husband and a wife plus God. God is the author of marriage. God never tended, uh, intended a relationship between a, man, a husband and a wife to just be the two of them, but, but the two of them plus him. So make Christ the third cord in your marriage, and you'll have a much stronger marriage. You come to your mate, maybe you feel a little insecure doing it, and say, why don't we pray together? Pray with your kids before bed. Pray with a friend. Recent study, men, you know, some men feel like, you know, my family doesn't seem too interested. My kids don't want to come to church, and my wife maybe not that interested. A recent study shows if a child is the first person in a household to become a Christian, there's a 3.5% probability everyone else in the house will follow. 
If the mother is the first to become a Christian, there's a 17% probability everyone else in the household will fall. But if the father is first, there's a 93% probability everyone else in the household will fall. Husbands, don't give up. Try to suggest things in your family. Let's read the Bible. Let's pray together. Let's go to church. The probabilities are with you. True, two friends trying to follow Christ together can help each other increase in faith. So if Solomon is right, that we desperately need close relationships with people, why do we have such a hard time cultivating close relationships? Why don't we do it? Why can't we do it? Why are so many of us loners? Solomon gives us the reason in verse 20 of chapter 7. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one does what is right and never sins. He says it's because we were all born with a sin nature. We're embarrassed by the ways we sin. We don't want other people to know. We'd rather hide than let people know how weak we are. We'd rather cover up our sin. Remember when Adam and Eve took a fruit from the tree God forbid them to take it from? And then we read that God came walking through the garden and they hid themselves. They just naturally hid themselves. Why? It's a natural human phenomenon. You do something wrong and then you hide. And we're still doing it today. We're too proud to humble ourselves and admit our struggles. We embrace the suburban myth that strong people don't need anybody. Strong people can make it on their own. They don't need to confess to their mate or pray with their mate because that will reveal how weak they are. They don't need a discipleship partner to become accountable to. They don't want a community group where they may have to admit they don't know how to handle a situation and ask people to pray for them. How does Jesus help? Jesus makes all the difference in the world. Jesus taught that we all have a sin problem. But he solved the problem by dying for our sins. If we confess our sins, he forgives us. But through the cross, we all stand equal before Christ. We all are sinners. We're all weak. There's no need to hide and act like we have it all together. We don't. We're weak. We need to confess our sins to Jesus and we need to continue to do it every day. And we need to be in a relationship with other followers of Christ to keep us strong. George Gallup Jr. has done studies on how to make a church healthy and strong. The assumption has been if you start a church and you can get people to come and make a commitment to Christ and then you can get them to build their spiritual growth with Christ by reading the Bible, trying to spend time every day with, like I talk about almost every week, with an open Bible and a journal. You, you, you grow with Christ. Well, it is true. To build a healthy church, you have to have individuals that are growing with Christ. But it turns out that's only half true. You have to have people that are growing with Christ, they're healthy, but they have to become engaged with other people in the church in friendship if you're going to have a healthy church. Now, as I see it, for people to be formed friendships in the church, there are only three ways. One, you have to serve. You notice the band that was up here? Uh, they really like each other. There's, there's different ones every week, but a lot of the same ones, and they've developed some friendships. Uh, Barb Sonnenberg, who uh, works with our hospitality, the food that we enjoy after the service, she says, since I started doing that a year ago, I've, I've developed friendships with so many women. It's been great. 
Second would be discipleship. We have a, probably 30 pairs of people meeting together each week, uh, mostly doing uh, this journal, and you know they, they study it together. If you meet with a person for a year or more, and you share prayer requests, you get to know each other. You develop a friendship. Third way is to join a community group. Now, in each case, you have to do something. Those things don't just come to you. You have to step forward and say, I, I'll help with this or I'd like to be in this. The path I want to emphasize today is getting into a community group. Community group tends to be a group of about 6 to 14 people. They meet every two weeks usually in a home probably. Most of the groups we have uh, study the journal. People prepare during the week and then they come and share about it. Uh, every one of you who comes to Portland Community Church, you want to get to know other people. You want to develop friendships. But you have to do more than just come and leave. It just won't, you won't, you won't get engaged to what Gallup calls a healthy, engaged church. You need encouragement and support. I know of no better way than joining a community group. The notion that strong people don't need anybody is a myth. We all need people. God made us to need him and to need people. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for teaching us this simple truth. Uh, we probably all know it, but many of us live as if we don't know it, that we need people. And if we're a follower of Christ, we need Christian people to support us. I want to give you a chance to respond to God today. If you maybe are not a follower of Christ, you've never given your life to Christ, first step would be to say, Christ, I want to have you in my life. Forgive my sins. I want you to become my Lord. You could do that right now. And then for many of you, maybe the step today is to say, you know what? I, I don't have many friends. Maybe I don't have any friends. And I don't have many Christian friends. Maybe I don't have any would you be willing to take the step today and make a commitment to God to say, you know, I've got to do something about that. I'll take a step toward solving that. Get in a community group. Serve somewhere. Let me give you a moment to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing all of our prayers, and we've seen today, we've been reminded today, learned today that we need other people, we need other Christian people in our lives if we're going to grow with you and be healthy. Help us to take steps toward that end, and thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. In Jesus' name, amen.